Welcome everybody. So I wanted to make a quick little video for you on what you need to know um, in preparation for our first chapter in pre-calculus functions. So what I did is I designed a couple questions and some problems to work through um, that's going to give you a good foundation just to kind of remind you on some of those essential skills and topics that we've learned in previous classes before we get into the functions unit uh, for pre-calculus. So, you know, just kind of look at, uh, kind of go through this worksheet real quick, you know, for number one, look at talking about domain and range and looking at determining if something is set of points are a function. Uh, question number two, we're going to look at evaluating different types of functions. For question number three, we're going to look into solving quadratic equations. And question number four is going to be solving and graphing inequalities using the number line. Question number five is going to be simplifying different types of expressions. And then number six, we're going to talk about transformation. So this is not a complete list of everything you need to know uh, to prepare for functions because there's going to be a lot of things that as we work through the curriculum, you know, are going to come up and we'll address them at this time. But these are some of these essential kind of skills that I've kind of found that I feel is a good kind of refresh for students before they get uh, deep into the function material for pre-calculus. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with re going through this work and you know seeing seeing what everything was again. You know, of course you forgot it um, or it's been a while. So the first question uh, states: Determine if the set of points represents a function or not. If so, determine the domain and the range. So just a reminder that the Remember, the domain is the set of input um, set of input values of a function, whereas the range is the set of output. Um, a function is is basically the definition of a function is where you have an input that uniquely maps to only one output. So you know you can think of these coordinate points here as x and y coordinates. Now we could list the the set of all the x coordinates. Like this is an x y. You know that's an x y and that's an x y. Well. When you write them as coordinate points, they're mapping to each other. That's like they are, you know, these are connected. This x is with this y. This x is with that y. So every x can only uniquely go to a one y. So the if you look at this, you know, this x zero goes with one. Three goes with five. Negative two goes with zero, and negative three goes with negative three. So it looks like every x uniquely maps to a y. So therefore, this is a function. So we can say, yes, it is a function. Now we need to remember what the domain and range are. Well, remember the domain is the set of all x values, um, typically, or the set of all input values. So I'm just going to use d for domain, and I'm going to use a set here. So I'm just going to list the coordinate points, 0, 3, negative 2, and negative 3. Then the range here is going to be the set of all y values, or output values. So that's just going to be 1, 5, 0, and negative three. All right. Um, for the next one, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and look at the list of the set of domain as well as the range um, before answering the question on domain and range. Because if I do the domain here, I get one, negative one, I'm sorry, one, negative one, and two looks like a repeat. So that's kind of interesting because two goes to one and two goes to negative one. Well, that doesn't work. That that goes against our definition of uh, domain and range here because one maps to one, you know, negative one maps to two, but two maps to one and negative two. So you can see when values from the domain go to two different y values, it's not a function. So technically, we don't even have an understanding of a domain and a range. We don't even really need to include that. But I wanted to write out the domain and I wanted to write out the potential domain and range so that you can see how this input value goes to two different um, output values. And just a quick reminder, remember that um, the you know, there's many different ways to represent a function. Points is one. We could do equations or graphs or, you know, mapping is another thing that we looked at. We're primarily going to be looking at equations and function, um, you know, equations as well as graphs. But this, the point method is a good way just to kind of refresh some things or at least our understanding domain range. All right, so here I'm just going to kind of quickly go. Three goes to zero. Yep, and one goes to negative two. Okay. 2 goes to 0, all right, and then negative 2 goes to 3. Now, this one's kind of interesting. 3 goes to 0 and 2 goes to 0. That's fine. 
if they can go to the same output. Like you can have two different inputs going to the same output. You just can't have the same in this one input going to two different outputs. So therefore, this is a function. All right, because it uniquely only goes to one unique output. It doesn't go to different outputs. So therefore, I'm just going to list the domain as a set of all x values. So that's going to be three, one, two, and negative two. Now the range there is a repetition, so we don't need to write it twice. Zero happens, you know, occurs twice. We don't need to write it twice. We just need to write it once. Negative two, um, zero, and of course I write it twice. Three. And again, you can see that three goes to zero and two goes to zero, but that's fine as long as they go to one. Each input domain cannot go to two different values, okay? So that was basically the good review for uh, functions and you know relations, domain, and range. Now let's go and look into evaluating uh, the following expression. So we're gonna work into some different functions. Hopefully these are all functions that you have um, you have had some experience with, so I'm not going to spend too much time because anything we have difficulty with, you know, we're gonna do multiple examples of. Just remember when we're looking to evaluate, that means we're looking for the value of the expression when x is equal to negative one. And since x is equal to negative one, that means we can replace x with negative one. So that's basically all I'm going to do. I'm just going to rewrite each expression and I'm going to use parentheses to represent me plugging in uh, negative one in for x. Now just be careful here, the double and the negative. So this is negative three minus a negative one. Um, so that's like, you know, that's really adding a positive one. So I have negative two. So that becomes a absolute value of negative two. Remember the absolute value is like the absolute distance from zero. So it's always positive. So therefore this becomes negative two times two, which is negative four. So I'm just kind of working in through my step-by-step -step so you guys can, again, remember that's an absolute value, not the number one. So you guys can see all of the math kind of going in from there. Uh, here we have three times negative one squared minus two times negative one minus four. Just remember we square the negative one, so not multi don't multiply by three first. So that's negative one squared, which is a positive one, times three. Negative two times negative one is a positive two, and then minus four. So again, let's just work from left to right. Three plus two is five, minus four is one. And uh, the next one here kind of looks a little crazy. We have a radical uh, square root as well as a squared, but that's okay. Just, you know, kind of, again, plug it in and see what happens. So five minus negative one squared. So again, kind of like what we did over here, but again, it's important just to kind of follow the order of operations. Remember when you have, you know, a function inside of another function, work from the inside um, innermost function. So the, in this case, we'd have negative one squared, which is going to be a positive one. Um, so then five minus one, positive one, is four, which then is going to equal, let's just do this. So this will be five minus one, and that's gonna be the square root of four, which is equal to positive two. Uh, for the next one is a cubic function. And again, this is working in practicing following our order of operations. So we have this uh, negative one that's being subtracted by one in, that's being raised to the third power plus two. So again, we make sure we follow the order of operations here that we are going to um, simplify inside the parentheses first and then raise it to the power. So negative one minus one is a negative two. Negative two cubed is negative two times negative two times negative Q, negative two, which is going to be a negative two times negative two is a positive four, times a negative two, which would be a negative eight, plus two, which gives me a negative six. Uh, the next one is the cube root. So remember like the square root is saying, you know, what number multiplied by itself, you know, is gonna give you a certain value. Well, the cube root is what number multiplied by itself three times, you know, um, is going to give you that radicant answer. So let's just go ahead and plug it in. So we have eight times negative one. I'm gonna close that, minus two. All right, so negative eight times negative one is a negative eight. A lot of people say, oh, you can't take the you know cube root. Well, remember square root, you can't take the square root of negative number, but the cube root you can because negative two times negative two times negative two, we just figured out is negative eight, or sorry, is positive eight. Actually, I'm moving too fast. So therefore this becomes the cube root of negative eight minus two. The cube root of negative eight is going to be negative two minus two, which is a negative four. 
All right, uh, so the next one is piecewise functions. And I know a lot of students have a really, really tough time um, working in with piecewise functions. So that is why, you know, when I teach this, you know, you actually spend a whole day going over piecewise functions because um, it's just one that students have a hard time, you know, wrapping their head around. But without getting in too much depth here, you know, if we want to evaluate this piecewise function for negative one, we got to follow, we got to look at the constraints. Um, this is for, we're only going to use x minus one for x values that are less than zero. And we're only going to use x plus one for x values that are greater than zero. Well, obviously our x value that we're evaluating is less than zero. So therefore we're going to use this equation. So therefore we're just going to plug in a negative one. minus one. And therefore we end up getting a negative two. So f of negative one, oops, well, I guess it's not really an expression, but f of negative two here is going to equal negative two. So therefore you can see how plugging them in there in for those expressions. So this is important to find the value of the expression as well as working on some of those order of operations, um, as well as going back to some functions that we maybe have not spent as much time on you know, previously. All right, so the next one is solving quadratic equations by factoring. This is something obviously that is um, huge if you're going through the pre-calculus and kind of like calculus track, you know, you see a lot of factoring come up and a lot of students, you know, have trouble uh, with the factoring. So the intent of this video is not to kind of break down the factoring process. Obviously, I'll have more of those videos, um, you know, available for those people that need it. This is really to kind of brush up on those factoring skills. So I will be doing factoring in my head. Um, I will explain a little bit, you know, where I'm getting those values, but, you know, I don't want this, um, Again, this is just a review of the factoring that we have already um, taught previous to pre-calculus. All right, so notice that they're all set equal to zero. These are all quadratics that we have set equal to zero. And I already told you that we're gonna solve them by factoring, so we don't need to worry about um, you know, using the quadratic formula or completing the square. These are all going to be factorable. And most of them are trinomials. We do have a couple binomials. Um, so we will look into you know, using either the square root method or looking into um, square root method or also looking into the uh, uh, difference of two squares. Oh, that would have been a good one. Yeah. All right, so let's go ahead and get into the first one. So again, if we want to look right into factoring, guys, we're looking into rewriting an expression as a product. So um, right here, basically, if you remember that a binomial times a binomial is going to, e it, when you multiply binomials together, you get a trinomial. So what that means is we can rewrite this as this is factorable. This trinomial can be rewritten as a product of two binomials. And remember, we can always check our work, right? Always check your work. So. Whenever I see a trinomial and I know that I want it to be factored, um, I'm going to break it up into the product of two binomials. And, you know, I don't like to usually teach with the FOIL, but that's kind of an easy way to understand that, you know, we know that the first two terms, you know, x times x, if we were to follow distributive property or FOIL, x times x would give us x squared. Now we got to think about what two numbers are going to multiply to give us two. Well, fairly easy. We only have two and one or negative two and negative one. But what we have to do is look at, well, if we're going to multiply those two numbers, what are the only two numbers that multiply to give you two, but then add to give you negative three? So you're combining those two values to get negative three, and you're multiplying to give you two. Well, hopefully you recognize that the two values are going to be x minus two and x minus one, right? And again, we can kind of check this. So x times x gives you x squared. I'm not going to do this for all of them, but I'll do it for this one. Negative two times negative one is positive two. And then you can see that negative two times x is negative two x. And negative one times x is negative x. So negative two x plus negative um, x is gonna equal negative three x. And again, if you need more help, work it out. Multiply it all out. And you'll see once you simplify this, that gives you that trinomial. However, that's not really what we're asking here, is it? We're asking to solve. So once you have this set equal to zero, once you have it factored set equal to zero, you can apply the zero product property. And the zero product property basically states if you have the product equal to zero, um, then you can set each one of those pro um, factors equal to zero and now solve. So here we have x equals two and x equals one. 
All right. And again, if you want to check your work, you know, plug them back in. Um, you can check your work on factoring by multiplying it, make sure it goes back. And you can also make sure, check your solutions by taking your values, plugging them in, back into the equation, and you should get equal to zero. All right, so the next one, we're going to work a little bit faster. You know, I'm looking at negative four. What two numbers multiply to give you negative four, but add to give you a negative three? So that's going to be an x minus four. I hate my fours. And an x plus one. Okay, again, I have my product equal to zero. So I'll go ahead and apply the zero product property. All right, so therefore we have x is equal to four and x is equal to negative one. All right, the next one is not a trinomial. So you could put a zero there, but that'd be kind of weird. Um, so let's look at some different factoring techniques. Well, the first ta factoring technique that I think we should always look for is just factoring out a GCF, the greatest common factor. And I didn't put this at first because you know a lot of students get to this and then they get struggle with the trinomials. So I wanted to do the trinomials first and then kind of work backwards. So let's factor out the GCF. The GCF here is an X. So we have X times x plus 5 is equal to 0. So again, we can apply the zero product property. x equals 0, that's relatively simple. And then x plus 5 is equal to 0. So x equals negative 5. Uh, the next one, we can do the exact same thing here. But hopefully you recognize that this is a difference of two squares. And you know, doing the difference of two squares, a squared minus b squared equals a minus b times a plus b. So hopefully you recognize this factored form is x minus 2 times x plus two equals zero. It's called a special factoring technique. And therefore, we can just say, if you set these both equal to zero, x equals two and x equals negative two. All right, so the next one is one that is going to get a lot of students because um, you know they struggle with this, like how can I factor this? And you could do one minus x, one plus x, and that's perfectly fine. Um, you know, it does say to do this by factoring. Now. While doing one minus x, one plus x would work, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, typically, we like the variable you know, to be in front of the number. So I'm gonna kind of show you a factoring technique, and then I'm also gonna show you, you know, way, another way we can do it. If we just needed to solve this, we didn't really need to factor this, we wouldn't really use factoring to do this. But my whole point here was really to get you guys to kind of prove your factoring skills. So the first thing I'd do is, if I needed to factor this, I'll rewrite this as negative x squared plus one equals zero. Then I would notice that they have a, um, I can factor out this negative one. And if I factor out the negative one, I get this as an x squared minus one equals zero. Now you can see this is a special um, difference of two squares again. So I can do x minus one times x plus one. Okay, now the negative doesn't really impact my answers at all. I can just divide out that negative one. You know, it's not gonna change any of my answers here. Um, so therefore, I'll still just have x minus one equals zero, and you know x plus one equals zero. So therefore, x would equal one, and x would equal negative one. So the negative, when you have something that's multiplied by your factors, but it's not actually you know a variable, if it's just a number, in this case negative one, it doesn't impact your solutions, and that's important, and that's going to come up quite a bit um, in some of these other problems. The other way you could just simply do this problem, if factoring wasn't really what I asked you to do, you could just add the x squared to the other side, right? And then we could do what we call the square root method, just take the square root to both sides. The reason why that's important though, remember when you need to introduce the square root, you gotta do plus or minus. So x equals plus or minus one. A lot of people, they don't wanna do factoring, so they do this method and then they forget that the square root of one when they introduce that square root is plus or minus. So you can see by doing it the factoring technique, you can see how we get the plus or minus negative one. So you can see you know, why that's kind of nice with the factoring not to make, uh, make those mistakes. All right, uh, the next one here is hopefully recognize you know, what two numbers multiply to give you nine that add to give you six. This is a uh, special, again, another special factoring technique. This is what we call a perfect square trinomial because the numbers that multiply to give you nine and add to give you six are exactly the same. X plus three times X plus three. So you can see that the solution is actually going to be repeated. You can rewrite it as you know, also x plus three squared, and then you know, take the square root if you like to. But either way, you see there's only one solution, x equals negative three, it just gets repeated. And that's something that we're gonna learn later you know, in the course from there. But it's just nice, important to see that this only gives us one solution. 
All right, uh, let's get on to three more kind of uh, trinomials. Again, we see this negative here. We don't really like the negative in front of our x squared, so I'm going to factor that out. So I get an x squared plus 7x plus 6 equals 0. All right, now I can just go ahead and factor this. What two numbers multiply to give me 6, add to give me 7? So again, I'll do an x plus 6 and an x plus 1. Okay, so then again, I have this negative, but you know, you could divide out the negative like I did over here. But a lot of times when we're looking at solving, we just like drop it. You know, we don't even do anything else. We're just like, eh, it's not really there. It's not necessary. It's not doing anything for us. So I'm just going to kind of divide it out, but not show that and just say we don't really need it anymore. It's not going to impact our solution. If you divide by negative one on both sides, you're still just going to get x plus six times x plus one equals zero. So then our solutions here is x equals negative six and x equals negative one. All right, uh, now we have some numbers in front of the x squared. So this is usually where a lot of students are gonna have some trouble. Um, fortunately for this first one though, we recognize that every single term of our quadratic is divisible by two. So that means I'm just gonna factor out the x squared. And fortunately for me when doing that, or you if you're doing these problems, that gives us another a quadratic, which actually gives us a, a perfect square trinomial. So I'm just gonna rewrite this as a two x plus two squared equals zero. Now again, hopefully you see that this two is not impacting anything. Like you can just divide out the two on both sides. That multiply that two in front does not change any of the answers, right? And if you were to take the square root of both sides, if you do it this way, again, you just get x plus two equals zero. There is no plus and minus of zero because zero is not positive or negative. So again, since this is a perfect square trinomial, you can see there's only one solution, x equals negative two. All right, so now let's get on to the last one um, where everything is not divisible by two. Um, hopefully, but you recognize with all the trinomials that I've worked on in so far in this paper that it's gonna, any trinomial, if it's factorable, it's gonna be rewritten as a product of two binomials. So I'm gonna rewrite it as a product of two binomials equal to zero. So I know that the first two terms need to multiply to give me two x squared. So I'm going to use two x and x. My last two terms need to multiply to give me two. Well, again, it's positive two, negative, positive two, positive one, negative two, and negative one. Those are my options, right? But my middle term now needs to add up to five x. So um, immediately in my head, I recognize if that needs to go to a positive five x, I need to work with positive two and positive one, right? I don't wanna work with negative numbers and try to add them to give me a positive. That doesn't really make sense. Uh, I also need to get kind of close to five. So I don't want to multiply two times one and one times two, but if I do two X, um, if I multiply that times two, that gives me a four X. And then if I multiply that by one, that gives me five X. And therefore, if I multiply this out in my head, hopefully by the end of this course or this chapter, you're gonna start getting to that point. You can see that I did factor it correctly. So now I'm just going to set each one of my factors equal to zero to apply the zero product property. And therefore, solving for x, I get x equals negative 1 half and x equals negative 2. So factoring is a big portion. Um, hopefully, you're, what you're going to notice is in the, what, you, what these need to know that I'm going to be providing here. Uh, there's going to be a lot of factoring. And hopefully, that's just going to build up your confidence as you get through the course. And that's not going to be something that's going to hold you back. Uh, the next one is solving graphing the solution using a number line. And I really wanted to kind of do these just so you guys can really understand. We don't really deal with inequalities as much um, in the pre-calculus, but I like you know working with this one for domain is this comes up quite a bit. And, and also just really kind of understanding you know when, uh, when equations are true, you know where where is the solution true? And if you remember, um, solving inequalities was just like solving equations. You basically you want to isolate your variable, and these are all relatively easy ones here. You know, two x minus one is greater than um, or equal to five. So again, you could treat this just like an equation. Um, isolate this x, but so we're going to use just use our inverse operations, kind of basic for us, but. Um, you know, either way, divide by two, divide by two. What happened that? Why did I not get a six? Uh, five plus one is six. So therefore divide by two. 
x is greater than or equal to 3. All right, so now we need to graph x is greater than or equal to 3. So what we're simply going to do here is just kind of create a nice little number line. I'm going to put 3 right in the middle. And I'm going to put like, you know, 5 to the right and 1 to the left. All right, so numbers to the right are larger. Numbers to the left are going to be smaller. And obviously, we want x as our solution. It has to be greater than or equal to. So to represent the or equal to, we're going to make a nice little dot and we're going to fill it in. And then if we want to represent all values that are larger than three or greater than three, then we're just going to do um, shade to the right of the number three and then put an arrow, meaning that all the values continually going in that direction are always going to be larger than three and they're always going to be a solution to that inequality. Uh, the next one here, we have five minus three x is greater than uh, four. So, <sighs> What we can do here is, you know, again, using my inverse operations, I'm going to subtract a 5. Then I'm left with a negative 3x is greater than negative 1. Um, now I can divide by negative 3. And if you guys, you know, remember, one of the things is, you know, whenever you're multiplying or dividing by a negative to solve an inequality, you're going to want to flip the sign. Um, and that isn't like a trick or anything like that. If you wanted to get around that, you could have simply just added 3x to the other side and then solve for the x in the positive form. So it's just the way that how it works out. Um, also notice that I have x is now less than 1 third. Now some people are like, well, how am I going to do a number line with 1 third? Well, just, you know, you are the master of your number lines. So is, if, if it's not an integer, that's fine. You know, here's my, here's 1 third. Ooh, that was not supposed to happen though. Okay, now what about numbers that are like larger than one third or whatever else? Well, let's just, you know, let's do something that's not as evil. Let's say, all right, here's one, <laughs> here's negative one, right? So we obviously know more positive numbers to the right are going to be larger than one third and negative numbers, you know, to the left are gonna be less than. Um, obviously this is not to scale, it's just one of their representation here. Um, x is less than, but it doesn't say equal to. So to represent that, we still need to show where we're starting. So we're going to use an open circle. And now what we're going to be doing is go ahead and using, sorry about that. Um, and now we're going to be using the number line going to the left. Okay. Um, and therefore you can see that how that uh, works from there. Now this next one's kind of interesting. The quadratic inequality. X squared minus one is less than or equal to zero. So again, this one is a little bit interesting. I just wanted to kind of work with the students, you know, as far as X squared minus one less than or equal to zero, you know, how do we really approach this? There are a couple different ways we can look at this. I think the best way to understand this conceptually is looking at what the graph would be. So if we had X squared minus one, for, so because for quadratics, remember when we were solving quadratics, you know, we, a lot of times we've got more than one answer. So I think it's easier to kind of understand when we're graphing a quadratic uh, or an inequality or a quadratic inequality to understand what the graph looks like. So if I know x squared minus 1, and if I was to think about that equation, I could graph that equation. It's going to look something like this. Okay. Now, again, this says is for what values is x um, going to, x squared minus, minus 1 going to be less than or equal to 0. Well, here's the value of 0 right here. So when is it less than 0? Well, this value here is negative 1, and this value here is 1. So it looks like it's going to be less than or equal to 0 for all values when x is greater than or equal to negative 1, and when x is is going to be less than or equal to positive one. So you can see that um, it's, oh, it has to be between those two. You just can't say it has to be greater than negative one because it's really the intersection of those two, right? Um, another way you could write it be like negative one is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to one. But it's just important, you don't want to use or. It's not like it has to be greater than negative one or less than one because over here is less than one right? But it's not, you know, gray or negative one. So it has to be that intersection domain. Now, obviously you could get around the same part. You could also work with this um, 
you know, algebraically, but you can see that's where some things kind of fall apart here, less than or equal to zero, I'm um, sorry, less than or equal to one. And so therefore, when you now take the square root of both sides, you're gonna get the positive one, x is less than or equal to one, but understanding how you get x is greater than or equal to negative one is the reason why we wanna get through this. So the best way, to, at least to understand that, I believe is to look at the graphical approach. All right, so we are almost done there, guys. Um, let's just go and look at simplifying expressions. And so we have a couple different ones, some uh, polynomials, some radicals, and as well as some rational um, expressions. So just remember when working um, with uh, expressions, or you know, we're working with you know polynomial expressions that we want to combine like terms. And combine like terms meaning that if you have a exponent, that they have the same base as well as the same power. So the three is what we call the coefficient. The coefficients don't need to be the same, but when you add like terms, you do um, you are going to be combining the coefficients. But our main thing is we need to have the same term. So x squared and x squared are the same term. They just have different leading co they just have different coefficients, but that's fine. These are like terms. This is not a like term. So therefore, this gives me four x squared plus a three x to the fourth. All right. Um, over here, we're basically just going to go ahead and to multiply out. Um, we, and it's important, you know, this is where like FOIL kind of breaks down. So we want to make sure that we understand this using, you know, distributive property. Every single term needs to be multiplied by every single term. All right. And sometimes you could use the box method, which is another thing that I teach. Um, but we'll get into that more, you know, once uh, once we get into the curriculum or, you know, also next chapter. But let's do x times 3x squared is going to be a 3x cubed. x times negative 4x is a negative 4 x squared, x times negative five is a negative five x. Now in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna add these two together. So I'm gonna use what we call the vertical method. And I'm just gonna take now negative one times three x squared, and that's gonna give me a negative three x squared. I'm just gonna put that down below because I'm going to add them vertically. You don't have to do it this way. This is just one method that um, we teach in the like algebra two, algebra one. Negative one times negative four is going to be, give me a positive four x and negative one times five is going to be a positive five. So now, as I combine these two together by adding them, I get three x cubed. Uh, negative four x minus three x is going to be a negative seven x squared. Negative five x plus four x is a negative x plus five. All right, uh, the next one, radicals. So same kind of thing with you know polynomials, you know, where there are the exponents. You know, when you're combining them, they gotta be like terms. What that means is the index of your radical, this little value here, if there's no number there, then we assume it's going to be the square root or two. Um, so you have to have the same index as well as radicand. Remember what's under the radical has to be the same. So this one's kind of tricky again, because again, we're looking at the number in front, four and four, and a lot of people say, oh, well, they're the same, but those are the coefficients. Coefficients don't make like terms. It's the index and the radicand. So therefore, you can see that these two terms are like terms. So I'm going to just rewrite this by grouping them together. So therefore, I can easily see which ones are like terms and which ones are not. Okay, so four times the square root of three x and two square root of three x is going to be six, yeah. Six times the square root of three x. Notice when I'm combining the terms, I'm combining the coefficients, but leaving the term, um, leaving those terms the same. And then plus four times the square root of two x. Just make sure those go over. Okay. Uh, the next one here is five times the square root of three x. Remember multiplication. Uh, just remember when you're multiplying your uh, when you're multiplying radicals that you multiply the radicands inside and you keep the index in the same. And also, if you have coefficients, you're going to multiply those. So in this case, I don't have anything to multiply the five by. However, um, in the radicands, I'm going to get a nine x squared. And then here I can multiply the five times two, so that's gonna be a negative 10. And I can only multiply numbers times numbers, right? So that's three times uh, six is going to be 18 x. Yeah. Okay, now obviously I can simplify this, the square root of nine. Um, so now you can take the square root of individual values here. So the square root of nine here is three. The square root of x squared is x 
minus 10. Square root of 18, we can actually break that up into the square root of nine times two, so that'd be times three, um, times the square root of two x, so we can't simplify that any further, so we're gonna leave that just as. Uh, therefore, we have 15x minus 30, square root of two x, and again, we're gonna have some common terms. I can see that these share a 15, so you didn't have to do this, but you know, let's just add them in there. If I wanna factor out my common term, 5 minus 2 comma 2x. Boom. So there's your two radicals. Now let's get into rational expressions. Um, so dividing. Remember dividing is the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. So this is not a fraction. So again, to turn anything to a fraction, just put it over 1. Um, if you need to divide, then just go ahead and rewrite it as a product of the reciprocal. So just flip that divisor that you have. All right, now you can multiply, remember to multiply straight across, not doing cross multiplying or anything. You could simplify it beforehand, but if you, um, you know, are a little bit not there yet, then don't worry. We can just rewrite this as x over 20x, and then the x's are going to divide out, and that's going to leave us with a 1 20th. Okay, uh, the next thing that we're going to be working on is the uh, fractions. Remember when we're adding fractions, um, with unlike terms, basically what we want to do is get a common denominator. So one denominator here, we have 3x. The other denominator, we have a 4x. So, you know, if we need them to be common denominators, we got to, you know, figure out the value, the denominator that they both were going to divide into. A quick and easy way to do that, it doesn't always work, but it's just to multiply 3x times 4x and that's gonna give us a 12x squared. But that doesn't give you the common denominator, right? Because we don't need to get a two squared. We, that's not the common denominator. The com least common denominator is actually just a 12x, right? We don't need x squared. So to get to a 12x, I can just multiply by a three over three and a four over four. Therefore, I get a four over 12x plus a three over 12x. Now, when multiplying rational expressions, remember we're just gonna add the numerators and keep the denominator the same. So therefore we get a seven over 12x. All right, and last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, we have identify the transformations of the parent function. And basically when we're doing this, you know, you can go ahead and play around with the graph I just wanted to remind you of some things. You know, feel free to plug these into a graphing calculator or into Desmos online or into you know a Google browser and see what they look like. I'm just going to kind of run through the transformations. Um, I'm not going to get too in depth, you know, with them because we spend some time on that. But I just wanted to identify the transformations here. This is going to be a shift up to. Um, remember when you're adding to inside of the function, though, that's going to have to be a shift to the left two units. And when we're not adding, so you notice how these two are adding. This is adding outside the function, that shifts the graph up. Here we're adding to inside the function, that shifts in the graph to the left. Here we're not adding to, we're multiplying by two. So what that does is that doesn't shift the graph at all. What that does is that actually stretches the graph. And since it's on the outside, that is would be what we call a vertical stretch. And instead of saying it's vertically stretched, you know, two, we're going to say a factor of two. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so that is kind of it. Um, you know, again, not a complete summary of everything you need to know uh, to prepare you for functions in pre-calculus, but I think a pretty good list to at least get you started on some types of problems some types of functions, some types of expressions, some types of processes that you are going to see in this upcoming chapter. And I really do feel that if you're able to, you know, work through these problems and feel pretty comfortable with the content um, that we went over, then you're gonna do very well in, in the functions unit. So I look forward to uh, being able to continue helping you uh, with that content. And obviously we will uh, get started with that next. So there you go guys, hope you enjoyed. Cheers.